It is a wonderful honor to welcome Professor Barry Latzer on this program. He is the Professor Emeritus of Criminal Justice at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice, uh, the City University of New York. And he is an author of a new book. It is titled The Myth of Overpunishment, A Defense of the American Justice System, and a proposal to reduce incarceration while protecting the public. How are you today, Barry? Thank you for joining the show. Okay, okay. I'm gonna hold that up for your viewers, John. Yes. There you go. Yes, that's, that's quite a title, huh? It should it go on to the back page, it's so long. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite a title, and of course, quite the book too. Um, I should like to begin by addressing um, the fact that you have uh, Senator Tom Cotton uh, as uh, the author of the foreword of the book. Yes. So tell me the circumstances leading up to that. Uh, yeah, well, I knew that Senator Cotton uh, had an interest in this issue. He had either given a talk, made a speech, or wrote something about it. He's interested in criminal justice issues. So... I uh, made contact through uh, one of his aides, one of his senatorial aides, and uh, the guy confirmed that the senator was definitely interested in uh, in doing a forward. Um, and I guess he uh, read through the, the the manuscript. It wasn't out as a book yet, obviously, and he must have liked what he read. And he wrote this whole thing. And he's a very smart guy. He's a Harvard law man. And he wrote really a beautiful uh, forward, rather impressive, in fact. Uh, uh, of course, I was pleased that, you know, he said flattering things about my book, but you'd expect that for the man who's writing the forward. So uh, he wrote a lovely forward, and it was obvious that uh, he didn't just dash this off. He was really interested in the whole subject in the entire issue, especially the issue of how the uh, progressives have exaggerated the uh, punishments for crimes uh, in, in order to really diminish the system. They want it diminished incarceration, especially is their... Uh, main target. So that's how it happened. And uh, I was, uh, I was, I was very happy. I think he's future presidential material entre new, by the way, Sean. <laughs> I hope I live long enough to see that. <laughs> Let's see. Um, I think as of right now, uh, he has not been in the running for the 2024 presidential no. race. No. Yeah, and he's smart, Chung, because first of all, he's a young guy. I think he's only in his uh, 40s, early 40s. And and second of all, uh, he doesn't want to get into that whole Trump mess, you know? Yes. I mean, why should he? Uh, the chances are that Trump will be nominated. Uh, and uh, there are other candidates who are have more name recognition than Cotton. And he could buy this time, right? What What's the hurry? So I think he's very smart to to wait, and uh, and then we'll see. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I should follow up by um, asking about the current criminal justice reform movement that you've uh, addressed, and as you've uh, have correctly mentioned, this is a movement mostly spearheaded by progressives. Um, so. Uh, what is um, what are some of the key, I guess, ideas of this reform movement, and to what extent do you believe that it has failed? I don't know if it's failed. I think it will fail, but I certainly don't agree with a lot of their views. Some of them I do, but uh, many of them I don't. I think the main target is incarceration, or as they call it, mass incarceration, which is really something of a misnomer. I mean, 0.06% of the population is incarcerated. I don't consider that very mass. <laughs> mass means huge numbers to me anyway. Uh, what they mean, of course, is over-incarceration, that too many people are being incarcerated. Well, I don't think you can answer that question. 
unless you know how much crime there is and unless you know who's being locked up. And, and that's what I address in the book. I try to show that the people who are locked up deserve to be there. They've done really awful things. So uh, I don't accept the mass incarceration uh, argument. The other argument that they make, another key point, is that the system uh, is uh, racially biased. And they point out the fact that uh, uh, well over a third of all prisoners are African-Americans, which is true. Uh, but of course, disproportionate numbers don't necessarily mean bias, as a philosopher would, would certainly testify. Uh, you can have disproportionate numbers of people there because of perfectly legal and legitimate reasons. Uh, that doesn't mean there's bias. Uh, in fact, when you look at the details of that, you find that that argument is also kind of lame. Uh, we know from other measures, not just imprisonment, that African-Americans have very high crime rates, especially the kinds of offenses that lead to uh, incarceration, like violent crimes. Now, if a group has very high violent crime rates, I think we would expect they would have high incarceration rates. I mean, that's what I would expect anyway. And I think most people who are honest about it would expect that. So once you start examining the numbers, that's what you see. Um, and, you know, maybe we could talk in a, in a bit about how I know this, how I know that, for instance, African-American crime rates are high, and I'll explain that. Um, but those are the main focal points, I think, uh, of the progressive movement with respect to criminal justice, over, over incarceration and racial bias. I think those are the two main arguments. I don't think either of them are valid points. So uh, part of this book then is really an effort to refute these arguments, to set the record straight. And, and even if people don't agree with what I've written, uh, let's have the discussion. That's my next, you know, my fallback position is, well, let's talk about that, but let's have a rational discussion. Don't, you know, try to just uh, shut me down. Uh, Let's talk. If, if I'm wrong, fine. Then I'll, I'll correct my errors. That's my view of the matter. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, I'm very happy to be sitting here with you discussing the books, as, the book as well as your the issues that you raise in this book. But I, I should also like to address, uh, you know, to what extent have you been, I guess, uh, barred from entering you know I, I, this kind of these kinds of discussions in say yeah. other public forums yeah well i guess i've been lucky or unlucky if you if you're martyred i suppose like trump uh, is claiming to be <laughs> i suppose you consider that a good thing i haven't been uh, i haven't been uh, canceled as they say uh, uh, maybe because I don't have enough invitations to speak, but whatever the reason, I haven't been. Now, what I have, what has happened to me, and I think is unfair, and, you know, maybe every author who's sort of ignored feels that way. I, my, my books have not gotten reviews in mainline reviews. So, for instance, you won't find a review of my book in the Washington Post or the New York Times or the Boston Globe. The Wall Street Journal has reviewed it. National Review has reviewed it, but not in the left-oriented or left-leaning uh, uh, media. So why is that? I mean, you would think this was a timely issue, right? And, you know, while I'm not maybe the greatest <laughs> researcher and writer uh, in the world, I'm, I'm, I'm decent enough so that I've produced a book that I think is at least worthy of discussion. But no reviews, no reviews. And, and uh, here's a little anecdote. 
when I wrote my book, The Rise and Fall of Violent Crime, which was back published back in 2016, and I saw that I wasn't getting a review, I wrote the book review editor, the Sunday book review editor of the New York Times. And I said, uh, her name is Pamela Paul. She's no longer the editor, by the way. And I said, dear Miss Paul, uh, uh, you know, I think this book would be interesting to your readers. It's on a very important issue, violent crime. It was uh, certainly a major issue for decades in the United States. And uh, I would think you would want to do a review of the book. So she emailed me back and she said, well, I never received a copy of the book. So I called the publisher up and I said, Pamela Paul, who, who's the editor of the New York Times Book Review, said she never received a copy. And the guy said to me, yeah, she got two copies. We sent, we sent multiple copies to her. So obviously this was just the uh, baloney. I'll, I'll use the less harsh word, okay? This was just a pretext for her not reviewing uh, the book. Uh, so I believe the publisher, I'm sure they sent her copies of the book because they want the book reviewed too, of course. And they, they just wouldn't, they wouldn't review it. They wouldn't review it. So I, I resent that sort of thing. I, and I think it's very unfortunate. And I guess it reflects, Chung, you know, the, the polarization of, of the country now, uh, where people on the right don't want to read anything written by anyone on the left and, and, and vice versa. And uh, it's uh, really unfortunate. I mean, that's why I like doing these podcasts. Uh, we have dialogue. Uh, and, and what's wrong with dialogue? What's wrong with discussing? I, I mean, that's it's the, the, the heart of philosophy, your field, and it's the, the heart of democracy too, isn't it? Yes. And um, I think I take your point on all of that. And plus, um, I was I became very much interested in, um, I guess, uh, reading about um, the surge of um, criminality in especially American cities, as well as uh, the lack of, I guess, proper and that's a tough enough uh, response by mm -hmm. some of the big cities as big as, as uh, lead prosecutors, right? Like uh, you have your... Yes. Um, George Gascon and um, Chase of Boudin and Alvin Bragg of uh, New York and yes. so on and so on. Um, the first book that I uh, picked up uh, was mm -hmm. uh, Criminal Injustice. Uh, the In was in parentheses by Rafael Mangual of uh, the yes. Manhattan Institute. Yes. He's a great mind. And he actually got a spot in the Daily Show uh, with uh, Trevor Noah to talk about it, which is clearly like that meaning and such. Yes. And... Yeah, I was surprised at that. And I know I know Raphael, by the way. I know him very well. Mm -hmm. I've, I've worked with him. He's a good guy. And uh, I know his book, too. Mm -hmm. And I've uh, also come across the research of um, Roland Fryer of um, Harvard University, well, formerly of Harvard University, um, mm -hmm. where he um, researches the, I guess, the disparities between... Uh, police encounters and uh, race in, uh, in America, especially American cities. But yes. um, to follow up on your previous answer, I, I think we, we should address the two biggest myths of overpunishment that you just addressed and you had addressed in your book too. One is that the quantity of people in prison in America are, are too, is too large and the people who are in prison are obviously aside from the serious offenders are those who are are there because of uh, low level offenses or nonviolent offenses or simply those who are couldn't afford a lawyer and therefore have the entire court system against him so to mm -hmm. what extent do you believe that this myth is well a myth <laughs> it is a myth I mean, the uh, the Justice Department has what they call the Bureau of Justice Statistics. And it's extremely objective, and they gather data on various facets of the criminal justice system. And nobody, nobody says that this uh, agency is biased. Uh, and nobody says that. 
So I rely heavily on their data. And their data shows something very interesting about who is actually in prison. When you look at the figures for the kinds of uh, offenses that lead to imprisonment, what you see is the overwhelming majority, it's now up to 62% of the prisoners, and this is in state prisons where roughly 90% of American prisoners are, are housed, their state crimes. 62% uh, are in for violent crimes, meaning murder, rape, robbery, assault, especially aggravated assault. Aggravated assault means the victim suffered some serious uh, injury. Uh, and various sexual assaults, crimes of that nature. Now, that's an overwhelming majority of the prison population. If the progressives want to make a case that these guys don't belong in prison, I'd like to see the case. We don't have any alternative punishments that we permit nowadays. In my book, I showed how in the early days of what ultimately became the United States, we used corporal punishments, uh, the stockades, uh, whipping, and, and, and physical punishments like that. But that was abandoned. And by the turn of the 19th century, we, we replaced it with the incarceration, the penitentiary. So unless they're arguing to go back to whipping, to flogging, uh, and I'm sure they're not, uh, the progressives have to come up with an alternative. Property crimes, by the way, are another roughly 16% of the uh, inmates sentenced in state prison. Uh, and drug crimes, which is another big point they make, drug crimes account for only around 12% of the inmate population. And three quarters of those drug offenders, Chung, are in there because they were dealing drugs, not just because they were shooting up, they were selling, okay, they were distributing. So most of the drug offenders are in for drug dealing. And so when you look at the actual prison population, what you find is they deserve to be there uh, because they deserve to be punished for what they've done. They've done very serious crimes. And here's something that's even more shocking. Well, two points. First of all, the time they actually serve in prison is rather short. The progressives look at the sentences that are imposed by the judge, but they don't look at what we call the time served because only 20% of all offenders actually serve their full sentence. 80% are released before they've served their full sentence, John. And the time they serve if you look at the numbers, it is relatively short. The, the Most prisoners that are released, the overwhelming majority, two-thirds of them, serve less than two years on, on average. Less than two years. And now, you know, you and I wouldn't do too well even two years in, in prison. Okay, fine. But these are hardened criminals. And less than two years doesn't seem to me to be a terribly onerous punishment. And the second point, when these prisoners are released, they turn to more crime. The, the, the Bureau of Justice Statistics actually tracked these guys after they were released from prison. And listen to this number, 83% were arrested again. 83% were arrested again after they were released, after serving time. So, I mean, <laughs> we're dealing with a very serious group of people who keep repeating their offenses and they deserve to be in prison. So, once we look at that and once we take those 
facts into account, the case against incarceration really, I think, falls apart. I, I think it just caves. It's wiped out by, by the by the actual data. Mm -hmm. right. So before we move on to the question of uh, recidivism, yes, uh, just a uh, tendency for people who have committed crimes and been in prison to recommit these offenses and send to prison yes. again. Um, um, I think one thing that, uh, you know, uh, say a thoughtful critic would gently protest uh, mm -hmm. when her hearing your answer is that, but to... I there should be a percentage of those who are in prison right now who are wrongfully convicted and mm. you hear stories of people who are wrongfully convicted based on false evidence or simply being in the wrong place at the wrong time you know, or you know, description matching another person who was not convicted those yes. stories about yes 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 now, first of all, it's true. <laughs> I don't dispute it. Uh, the percentage of prisoners who fall into this wrongfully convicted category is very small, a very small percentage. It's horrible when it happens. It, it's horrible. It pains me to hear some of these stories of of truly innocent people who were punished. I think that's terrible. The question is, what should we do about that? It doesn't represent, not even not a majority, it's not even a small percentage of the prison population. It's a teeny tiny percentage of the prison population. This is human fallibility though, Chung, I mean, you know, the guy upstairs, he's, his judgment is perfect, right? You and I, our judgment is not. It's fallible. So given the fallibility of human judgment and the need to punish criminals, what should we do? I mean, we, no sane person would say, well, we can't have this. This is horrible. How can you punish innocent people? Let's close the system down. Yes, that would do it. <laughs> but no, no, as I say, no sane person would make such an argument. I mean, that's impossible. So we could change the system to make it harder to convict people. Hopefully that would reduce the errors, the wrongful punishment. But what it would also do is it would give a, a free ride to the criminal because the harder you make it to convict, the more guilty people will go free. This is a zero-sum situation, isn't it, right? If I make it harder to convict a man, well, then it's more likely that he'll get off. If he's guilty, then a guilty man will go free. So there's a tension in the system between those who are innocent and those who are not. And we have to resolve that tension. We can't just say, uh, okay, that's it, no more criminal justice system because I can't bear punishing innocent people, right? We can't say that. So it's a matter of, of tinkering with the system, of adjusting the system to try and prevent that kind of horror from occurring. But you know what? I'm sorry to say this. It's going to occur anyway. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen anyway. Because human judgment is fallible. And there are certain things that occur that, that we might change to, to, to reduce this possibility, certainly. I, I don't say there's nothing we can do. There are things we could change. But they're not going to be things that lead to the the widespread release of, of guilty offenders. I think that would be totally unacceptable to the public, totally unacceptable. That's not going to happen. 
Well, um, so moving on to the question of recidivism, um, it's um, yes. so. What are some of the causes you can attribute to, you know, the rate of recidivism amongst people who have been convicted and spent time? Well, I mean, uh, there are a laundry this laundry list of causes that one can, you know, one can show. Uh, yes. One being that uh, well, we as a society have failed to uh, integrate. Uh, former inmates back into society or yes. uh, uh, as you've alluded to the the criminal justice system now you know populated by lenient district attorneys have insufficiently sentenced and punished them uh, so that they they will they still end up hardened criminals or it could be the individual's uh, error in his or her ways uh, which yes. ones do you, do you find to be I guess yes. the most reasonable. Yeah. Uh, there's no question that uh, underpunishing contributes to more crime. I don't think there's much question about that, although that is challenged. That has been challenged. There have been some studies that have shown that increasing uh, sentences does not reduce recidivism, has the opposite effect. But then there are studies that show just the opposite, that increasing the punishment does reduce recidivism. Um, so the studies are, uh, you know, all over the place uh, on that sort of uh, thing. Um, I'm not too hopeful that you could really reduce recidivism. Uh, however, I would say this. Uh, one of the goals of punishment we the criminologists call it incapacitation. It's to protect the public. So if you have a dangerous offender, uh, letting him out in under two years is a risky proposition. So I would say in that case, longer time served would be more protective. It would give you more incapacitation. So if we could figure out who is going to recidivate, we might want to lengthen the sentences for their punishment. The trouble is <laughs> we're not very good at figuring out who will really be the one to recidivate. In other words, we really don't know the causes of individual lawbreaking. If we did, of course, we could take uh, more robust uh, action uh, from a policy standpoint. Why do they recidivate? I guess there aren't enough uh, forces, sufficient forces to uh, discourage recidivism. One of the proposals I make in my book is electronic monitoring, which I think would serve as a, a a, you know, a counter recidivism uh, a policy. So uh, we could talk about that at some point, but we're just not sure who does recidivate. I mean, we know certain offenders uh, do seem to, sexual offenders, for instance, uh, burglars, uh, because the crime, uh, the crime is, is a good one to commit if you're into crime. Uh, first of all, real burglars don't go into premises when they're occupied. Real burglars usually, therefore, don't have witnesses against them. So uh, that's a nice crime to commit. You know, you get the goods and you get out and you don't confront anybody. So there's no one to serve as a witness against you. So burglary is, is a very uh, under-punished crime. Very few burglars uh, are caught. Um, but in any event, it's very difficult to, to know in advance when you're dealing with individuals who will be the one to repeat uh, his offenses. Um, this is one reason I favor more electronic monitoring. It's not a panacea, but I think that would be really helpful, John. I, I, I think it, it's something we need to expand in the United States. Yes. I'll stop there because I don't want to go off on a tangent. Mm -hmm. 
and we can certainly uh, uh, revisit the topic of uh, e-carceration or electronic yes. monitoring. But yes. uh, let's move on to the the second uh, big myth of overpunishment, yes. and that be the prison population is uh, uh, disproportionately mm, uh, yeah, uh, black and Latino, and mainly black yes. and Latino men, and yes. of course, um, even before the Black Lives Matter movement and the post George Floyd protests, um, it has been generally perceived that these are the two groups of people who are most socioeconomically disadvantaged. And therefore, um, the leap of logic that, uh, say, Black Lives Matter protesters, as well as um, you know, these criminal justice reform-minded um, uh, elected officials would say is that well, prisoners and the entire criminal justice system is designed, so to speak, to punish uh, people who are socioeconomically disadvantaged and mm -hmm. those who are socioeconomically disadvantaged because of their race, race uh, in particular being Black and being Latino. So mm -hmm. um, what would be your response against uh, these allegations? Yeah. I think you've given a very succinct presentation yourself uh, on, on the position uh, of progressives. I think that's... Uh, precisely uh, their view. Now, a couple of points. First of all, it is true that when it comes to violent crime, for instance, and other offenses that lead to prison, uh, poor people uh, are the overwhelming offenders. Uh, there's no question about that. However, these crimes are not motivated, for the most part, by a desire for economic gain. It's not as if they're stealing because they're hungry and they need food. It doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. These crimes are, by and large, motivated by other things. Uh, anger, disputes, gang conflict, okay? Interpersonal quarrels, disputes, of course, being the same type of thing. Uh, Sexual motivation in the case of sex crimes. This has nothing to do with money. Money, money is not relevant to these crimes. Um, so why is it that poor people predominate? So my theory on this, uh, Chang, is this. It's not so much that poverty is motivating the crime. It's that affluence suppresses crime. Why is that? And what does that mean? When you make more money, when you become middle class, let's say, or, or more, okay, you have everything to lose by engaging in those kinds of behaviors. Everything to lose. Probably you'd be lousy at being a criminal anyway, and you'd get caught. And if you get caught, you're going to be punished. You're going to lose your wife and family. You're going to lose your job. You're going to lose your reputation in the community. You're going to lose everything, everything. So it's dumb for a middle-class person, an affluent person, to become a robber, to become a mugger. <laughs> it's just stupid. It's self-defeating. Affluence, then, suppresses violent crime. Now, I know we occasionally have sensational cases. Some wealthy man, the case in South Carolina, this wealthy lawyer who murdered his wife, uh, just found guilty of, of doing so. And of course, that made newspaper headlines all over the country and went on and on for, for a week. I got that. But that's an exceptional case. In fact, that's why it's so interesting, right? It's so unusual, okay? Poor people murder poor people every day of the week in large numbers. Doesn't make headlines, does it? No. This guy, because he's a because he's a prominent attorney, murdered one person, his wife, and that's headlines for, for days and, and, and maybe weeks. Okay, so affluence is a deterrent to violent crime. And poverty is not the reason for committing these crimes. 
It's simply that the affluent are out of the picture. They're, they're no longer involved with it because it would be self-defeating for them to be involved uh, with it. Now, the second point I'd make is this. Some social groups have more uh, higher crime rates, more involvement, in, in, especially in, in violent behaviors, than other social groups. This is a fact. Why is that the case? That's kind of tricky. Let me give an illustration. About a month or so ago, there was a study done by Columbia University researchers. It was on Asian in New York City. And you know what they found? And this caught my attention. They found that the Asian population, it may have been just Chinese, I'm not sure, I don't remember anymore, okay? But it was an Asian category or subcategory. They found that the Asian population had a higher poverty rate than the black population of New York City. Really, I said? A higher poverty rate than the black population of New York City. Yes, they proved it, they gave the numbers. Well, of course, I went and I checked to see what the arrest rate was for serious crimes in New York City. And I compared the arrest rate of African Americans in New York and Asians in New York. And no surprise, what did I find? Of course, the Af African American rates were much, much higher than the Asian rates. Well, gee, how come a group with higher poverty rates has lower crime rates than the other group. So this proves the point that I've made and, and, and I'm making again to you. Some social groups have higher violent crime rate and other crime rates as well than other social groups. Why it's this is so is difficult to explain, but it's definitely a fact. It's definitely a fact. And the perfect example is this study, as I say, of Asians in New York City. And as far as I know, no one has ever disproved, when I've made this point repeatedly, no one has ever offered any, any proof that it wasn't the case. Here's another example. There were terrible uh, 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 shootings, terrible uh, uh, bunches of shootings in Philadelphia. And the New York Times which is kind of left-leaning, picked up on the story. And they didn't say anything about who was doing the shootings and who was being shot, but it was clear from, the, from most of the discussion that it was happening largely in the African-American sections of Philadelphia. So I did a little research on poverty in Philadelphia. It turns out that the Latino population of Philadelphia is much poorer than the African-American population of Philadelphia. But it also turns out the Latino population of Philadelphia doesn't nearly shoot at one another the way the Black population of Philadelphia does. Didn't have the same murder rates, not even close. Well, isn't that interesting, huh? The poorer population has lower crime rates than the wealthier population. So this is more proof of the point that the correlation between poverty and crime isn't what the progressives think it is. It just isn't. There is no consistent relationship between the, the depths of poverty of a group and the, the violent crime of, of that group. It's not consistent across the board. Um, I think still, um, even three years after George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter protests, the narrative of Black Lives Matter is still dominant across uh, American popular culture. And I would say even more popular among Canadian popular culture too, because in yeah. addition to um, yeah, the Black population, uh, the issue of uh, their Indigenous Canadian population is also a matter of debate because they have also been historically marginalized and socioeconomically disadvantaged in yes. broad term. 
Um, yes. But nevertheless, you know, you, um, you know, once you present these um, facts to someone who is sympathetic to the Black Lives Matter narrative, they would uh, give you a laundry list of the names of um, Black American men and women, and sometimes mm -hmm. children too, in the case of uh, Tamir Rice, who was 12, of uh, yes. being, you know, having encounters with the police and then was, uh, and the results was fatal. They were, they were killed yes. in police custody. Of course, George Floyd is now really famous. Uh, and of course, there are cases like Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown and um, Breonna Taylor, uh, to name a few. Yes. Um, you know, one can say that um, the availability heuristic uh, enables these stories to make uh, headlines faster than, say, someone with a different skin color being victimized by the same, you know, police abuse of power. But sure. one cannot deny that perhaps there is such a thing as police abuse of power, and it yes. may be racially biased in some way. So, yes. um, so to what extent can you uh, counter this narrative? Here again, we have to look at the numbers. The uh, uh, the the proportion of African Americans who uh, were victim, if you want to call them victims of lethal encounters with police is about 25, 30%. 70% uh, or more are not African-Americans. So the police are obviously having lethal encounters with a lot of folks who are not in that category. Um, secondly, if you examine the cases, all of the cases, what you'll find is that in almost every case, the person who was, again, victim in quotes of the lethal encounter was threatening either the police or other people, violently threatening them with a weapon. Uh, and, and so in almost all of these cases, the police really didn't have too much choice. Uh, if you and I see uh, somebody threatening someone with a gun, you and I can turn around and walk the other way and, and hide. <laughs> The cop's not supposed to do that. His job is to go there and confront and, and, and deal with the threat. He can't just walk away. If he walks away, he'll be fired. So police have to deal with these violent people. And they, in some cases, have to use lethal force against them. So one has to examine the cases. This is somewhat similar, Chung, I think, to the, the miscarriage of justice cases. Yes, they happen. Yes, they're horrible. They're horrible. Uh, but they are a small minority uh, of the cases. They're, they're not typical cases. They are the cases, of course, that are picked up by the media and presented by the media, along with often a narrative of race bias reinforcing, of course, that perception that there's race bias. But that's not what all the cases are about, Chung. They're just not. The police have to deal with very violent people. And at times, these are people threatening the police or private citizens, and they have to be dealt with in a violent way. Again, this is the, this is the sad reality of the, of the world of criminal justice. So, uh, you know, people deride the rotten apples explanation, the bad cop explanation for these events, uh, but I, it's it's a valid explanation. Um, most police n never fire their their uh, revolvers, their service revolvers at all in their entire career, and uh, when they do, it's usually because of absolute necessity, a, a, a present immediate and violent threat. And in the cases where that's not so, uh, well, we need to investigate. And if need be, we need to punish that police officer. And that's the way the system does. And that's what the system should do. So again, I, I don't think this is a case of systematic racial bias by which 
we mean uh, that it's commonplace. It happens over and over again. It infects, let's say, most of the law enforcement agents. I, that just is not true. It, it simply is a false narrative. Okay. So uh, we've alluded to this uh, at least a couple of times now, and I think it's good. It's worth mentioning, you know, uh, the narrative surrounding the war on drugs. I suppose uh, perpetuated by you know, liberals, progressives, and of course libertarians too. And yes. This is the this is the idea that you know, the war on drugs has uh, have uh, kept so many people in jail you know, and have uh, uh, stolen away so many livelihoods by keeping them in jail. Meanwhile, uh, um, was ineffective in the reduction of the proliferation of uh, of harmful substances in society. Yes. yes, and of course, the race dimension is also added into it too um, yes absolutely, so, absolutely. Um, um i guess uh perhaps it would be kind of a stretch for for me to ask you to justify the war on drugs mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. at least uh what i would like to ask you is uh to what extent are this is this like <clears throat> is this narrative a myth um a little history on this uh the uh, craze for crack cocaine uh, began in the middle 1980s. It accelerated in the late 80s and went into the early 1990s. And this cocaine craze uh, generated huge numbers of violent offenses and nonviolent ones, especially by females because the males are more violent than the female, do much more violent crime. Huge numbers of violent crimes occurred, motivated often by uh, drug dealing gangs who were fighting over turf territory. Now, overwhelmingly, these gangs were African-American and overwhelmingly these wars, these drug wars, took place in Black communities. And guess who pressed the federal government, the Reagan administration at the time, to do more about it? The Black leadership in the United States. The Black caucus in the U.S. Congress pressed Reagan and pressed him hard to do something about it. Our neighborhoods are being destroyed, they said, by this drug dealing. And we want much more aggressive policies. <laughs> well, guess what? The federal government engaged in more aggressive policies. So did the, the states. And, and what would that mean anyway? Well, of course, they locked up a lot of people, mostly drug dealers, but some also drug possessors. Despite that, the truth is that in the case of, 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 of Blacks, that was not the big driver in Black imprisonment. That accounted for maybe 20% of Black imprisonment at the maximum. 80% of Black imprisonment was accounted for by violent crimes or serious property crime. So it wasn't the real driver, even though I know Michelle Alexander's book alleged that that the war on drugs caused mass incarceration and racially biased incarceration. She's wrong. It's not true. Uh, and 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 I'm not the only one who says this, by the way. Uh, John Pfaff, law professor at Fordham University Law School, made the point before I did. He proved that only about 20% of the uh, of the uh, <clears throat> increase in black incarceration was caused by the war on drugs. By the way, if you would eliminate the drug convictions for whites in prison and for blacks in prison and for Latinos who are not considered white, if you wanna view them as a separate category, the proportion of prisoners remains about the same. It doesn't change. 
Why is that? Because as I said, most of the African-Americans who are in there are in there for violent crimes and serious property crimes. So, you know, we could have a debate about the effectiveness of the war on drugs. And, you know, most people now think, I guess the consensus is that it went overboard. But remember, it wasn't just a, a, an effort to get people to stop using drugs. It was also an effort to suppress the violent crime that was associated with the drug. And there was a tremendous amount of violent crime in the late 80s and early 90s. In fact, in some ways, that was the sort of the apogee, the peak of the uh, violent uh, crime in the United States in, in, in the 30 year period uh, prior to that. That was the peak. And it was because of the crack cocaine wars. So that was the motivation for it. Now we have to ask ourselves this question, I think, to answer your point. Uh, you know, do, should we have, have a war on, on drugs? Um, how should we handle when we have these uh, drug use epidemics, really? It was an epidemic. Uh, what should we do about that? Uh, sure, treatment. For addicts, yes, right. But what are you going to do to prevent other people, usually young people, but not always, from, from using and moving from relatively mild uh, marijuana use to much more serious heavy drug use? What are we going to do to, to prevent that? For sure, someone's going to say, well, we need to use all the tools in the toolbox. And one of the tools of you know, social constraint is the criminal justice system. So here we go. <laughs> here we go. We're going to really, you're going to lock people up now for selling drugs or using drugs. Really? So there you go. There's your war on drugs. And uh, it's a debatable point whether that's an effective way to suppress the use of uh, hard drugs. It's a, I, I understand it's a debatable point, but uh, it's a debate we've had in this country, and uh, I hope we don't have to have it again. But you never know. We, we might. We, we have a, a, a big drug problem now. It's not the same. It doesn't engender violent crime the way cocaine did, because the methods of distribution are different. We use uh, our phones and we use the Internet now. <laughs> to obtain these drugs. So it's a, a different system of distribution and that doesn't seem to engender the same levels of violent crime. But who knows? Who knows? We may have to face the question again. And that's how I frame the question. Do we want to use all the tools in the toolbox, including the criminal justice tool with the consequences of, of using that? And it's more a question than an answer. So um, let's uh, discuss your proposal for expanding um, electronic monitoring, or what you call e-carceration. Of course, yes. that includes uh, you know house arrests and ankle bracelets and such. And yes. I think we are blessed that technology has advanced to such a point that these devices are possible. And yes. I believe that. Of course, uh, I agree with you that it can um, achieve both the goal of reducing the prison population as well as uh, maintaining public safety. So um, I'd like to hear uh, your proposal in much greater detail. Yes. Well, if you recall, just a few minutes ago, I made the point that so many uh, state prisoners, once released, commit additional crimes. Uh, what can we do about that? That was one of your follow-up questions. Well, we have parole officers who are supposed to be monitoring these released offenders. And I'm not saying they're, they're slackers. I'm saying they're overwhelmed. They have so many offenders per, per officer that it's really impossible for them to closely monitor. So what are we going to do about that? 
Here's where electronic monitoring enters into the picture. And I agree with you, we are blessed with all its faults. Technology provides many wonderful advantages to us. And we in the United States were among the prime developers of this technology. We invented a lot of it. We use it in so many ways. We're all tethered to our cell phones, right? It's become a part of everyday life. I want to see greater use of technology by the criminal justice system. Let's, it doesn't have to be bulky ankle bracelets. Maybe in the future, they could figure out how to do more miniaturization of, of these, of these uh, devices. Uh, maybe they can make them less uh, obvious, less obtrusive. I know I just got wind of an experiment uh, being used in, uh, I think it was Cincinnati, Ohio, where they want to use smart watches for uh, uh, monitoring uh, of released uh, offenders. Uh, fine, I'm all for the experiment. Let's see if it works. Uh, yeah, of course, if he could take the smartwatch off and give it to his girlfriend and say, here, hold this, honey, while I go out and do a burglary, that's not very good. But we'll see. I, I'm, I'm all in favor of looking at uh, reforms of these things, improvements to these things, uh, newer technologies. I, I'm all in favor of it. But to me, the advantages are, are clear. You really give encouragement to the released offender to not reoffend. You encourage law-abiding behavior because he knows he's being monitored. We call that deterrence, right? He, he can be deterred through technology. And I want to take advantage of that. And I think the United States is falling behind on this. Uh, some of the most progressive countries in the world, Norway, for instance, uses electronic monitoring big time. Why can't we? I mean, if Norway can do it, why can't the United States do it? So uh, I've seen the arguments against, and, and I'm not impressed. Uh, I think uh, this is a great opportunity for us to take advantage of the technology that we developed, that we invented, and use it for great social benefit. And so that's what I'd like to say. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I hear stories about like how um, this, um, this character, uh, Ander, Anders Breivik, uh, who was responsible for that horrible terrorist attack, I think it was in 2011, and he's still sitting in jail now. But um, yes. if you hear descriptions of his jail system, you, you know, you come up with the impression that, well, he's kind of like living in a hotel. And, yes. yeah, he obviously can leave, but with the conditions that the Norwegian government is providing him, uh, why would anybody want to leave? Of course... <laughs> On one hand, you know, I, I don't think we should make prisons uh, the same way as we make like five star Hilton hotels. But on the other hand, um, I hear stories about how places like Rikers Island, where condi conditions are just so depraved and the, the guards are so demoralized that it rather than you know helping to reform and rehabilitate the prisoner, it just creates a condition where, you know, someone who may not have started out violent became violent as you know as a means to protect him or herself so yes to what extent should the conditions of prisons in the united states be approved uh yes and often they point the critics point to uh, germany and to scandinavian countries where the prisons are far less harsh and uh uh, yes, in some cases they are like dormitories, uh, uh, not quite hotels maybe, but, but dormitories at least. Um, to do this, uh, you have to have a, a very high ratio of personnel to prisoners. Uh, and because they don't have as much crime, especially really bad, violent crime, they don't have guns the way we do in Europe. They don't use guns the way we do in Europe. Uh, seven out of 10 of our murders are with a gun, not so in Europe. Whenever you hear of some murders in Europe, it's usually with a knife, uh, you know, up close and personal, so to speak. 
rarely with a gun because you can't get guns in Europe so readily. Uh, so they don't have as much gun crime. They don't have as much serious violent crime as we do. And therefore, uh, they don't have as many prisoners uh, as we do per capita, far fewer. So their ratio of personnel to prisoner is much more favorable. Uh, we can't do that uh, without uh, a huge expense uh, to uh, to to uh, to our criminal justice uh, budget, a huge increase, I should have said, to our criminal justice uh, budget, huge. I don't think the public would support that kind of thing, even if they accepted the concept of of prisons that are less harsh. Uh, I don't think they'd pay for it. So I just don't think it's feasible in in the United States. Does that mean we should do nothing? In other words, we should leave everything the way it is? No, of course not. Of course not. Uh, so I'm for reasonable reforms and, and things will change and will be reformed. Uh, but uh, for us to go, you know, the German or Scandinavian prison route, I think is an almost an impossibility because of the expense of it, quite frankly. So even if we buy in principle that essentially what they're arguing in Germany and Scandinavia is that uh, the incapacitation is the punishment, and that's all there needs to be. The fact that you're not free to go where where you want, when you want, that's the punishment, and that's all the punishment you really need. And, and that's their philosophy uh, in Germany and Scandinavia. And that's fine, because they can afford to, to do it, but we unfortunately cannot in the United States. <laughs> All right, so uh, final question. Um, yes. The uh, book of Deuteronomy has the invocation, uh, justice, justice, thou shalt pursue. Um, it should be important why justice is mentioned twice because uh, there's no redundant word in the Bible. Because, mm -hmm. well, um, I think uh, when applied to the case of criminal justice, uh, it should be you know uh, emphasized that aside from obviously uh, you know, handing out punishments to you know the the offenses in ways that is well effective and just. We must also treat the the offender as as justly as we can, and um, this is where the balance between uh, public safety and justice and obviously mercy to the offenders should be both pursued and balanced. So how do you yes. suppose uh, that balance can be achieved? <laughs> well said. Well said, Sean. Um, that balance will never be permanently achieved. That balance is something we need to pursue, and we will need to pursue long after I'm dead, and sorry to say, even after you are. This is a never-ending and perpetual uh, uh, goal to, to balance uh, uh, the treatment of the guilty and, and the treatment of the innocent, to pursue justice as fairness for all. Uh, it will never end. It can't ever end until the end of times. Uh, it's something human beings must continue to try to achieve uh, as, as best they can. And, and, and I'm not being a, a glib here, and I'm not uh, just engaging in glittering generalities, because there are specific things, as we've talked about, that can be done and need to be done. But the overarching goal of achieving true justice uh, is is a never-ending uh, uh, struggle. On that wonderful note, thank you very much, Professor Barry Latzer, for joining this show. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure conversing with you.